This week on Perspective, deal or no deal, Iran, the nuclear accord, and human rights. This past week, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made international headlines with a PowerPoint presentation. Well, tonight I'm here to tell you one thing. Iran lied. Big time. A fierce and determined skeptic of not only Iran's commitment to the international nuclear agreement, but a critic of the deal itself. Netanyahu presented details of what he described as Iran's secret nuclear archive. Vaults of information, 55,000 pages, 55,000 files on 183 CDs that he says show Iran's detailed plans to develop nuclear weapons. Many analysts suggest the information is old, already known. Others suggest it shows Iran still has a nuclear plan in waiting. However, it's viewed the display comes at a critical time. In a matter of days, U.S. President Donald Trump must decide whether to continue to waive the U.N. sanctions that were lifted as part of the nuclear accord. An agreement Trump has called the worst deal in history. European leaders have been urging him to stick with it. There's been talk of renegotiation or a supplementary deal and a lot of speculation about what would happen if the U.S. just walked away. All of this comes against the background of Iran's dismal record on human rights. According to the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, more than 500 people were executed in Iran last year. Hundreds more imprisoned for exercising basic rights of free speech or assembly, for example. In recent months, Iranians have protested, angry about government corruption and demanding jobs. It's reported that thousands have been arrested. A new creative protest has emerged, with activists posting slogans on banknotes. And then there's Iran's aggressive and brutal reach in the Middle East, notably in the wars in Syria and Yemen. All of that is our focus on the program this week. We'll take a closer look at human rights and what pressure countries like Canada might bring to bear. We'll speak with longtime human rights advocates Erwin Kotler and Payam Akavan. But we begin with Mark Dubowitz, one of the foremost experts on Iran and sanctions and CEO of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies in Washington, D.C. It's been pointed out that the presentation by Prime Minister Netanyahu this week uh, didn't reveal much that was new. What, what do you make of it? Well, that's actually completely incorrect. I mean, there's, there's new information coming out every day. In fact, the nuclear scientists from the Institute for Science and International Security are revealing every day, including today, uh, new information that we didn't know about, about the extent of Iran's nuclear program, their military nuclear um, testing, and uh, an Iranian regime mendacity with respect to its nuclear program. So new revelations and uh, some blockbuster th things to come. Are they current, though? I mean, because the argument from some of the critics is that the information relates to previous times. Well, it relates to previous times, um, up to probably 2009. It may go beyond that. We're still learning new details. Obviously, it's a massive atomic archive right. with over you know 100,000 documents and videos and photographs. So it's going to take some time to go through it. But I think, also the most important thing to recognize is that Iran hid this atomic archive after the nuclear deal was reached in 2015. And it contains all the blueprints and detailed information that it needs to restart its nuclear weaponization testing. That's a clear violation of the nuclear deal. And it should make everybody concerned that if Iran truly is committed to a peaceful program, why did they hide this massive atomic archive? And why do they have all this information that they can use to restart their program at a time of their choosing? In a matter of days, President Trump has to decide whether to continue to suspend the sanctions against Iran's central bank. And he's obviously talked about doing more than that, about scrapping the nuclear agreement altogether. What happens if he does that, if he scraps the nuclear deal? Well, certainly the uh, U.S. will put back all of the sanctions on Iran, um, so massive economic pressure on the Iranian regime which will have certainly uh, far-reaching domestic consequences for the regime at a time where they're facing almost daily protests from Iranians on the streets. And this is the base of the regime. You know, this is as if uh, Donald Trump were to lose Alabama. Um, that's certainly he wouldn't want to wake up one morning and hear, you know, death to Trump in the streets of Alabama. Well, that's what the Supreme Leader and President Rouhani are hearing when they wake up every morning from their base. So far-reaching consequences domestically inside Iran as well as um, potential uh, escalatory scenarios where the, you know, the Iranians may decide to walk away from the deal themselves, escalate their nuclear program, 
that obviously has got far-reaching consequences for, uh, for U.S. security, for the security of our allies, and could lead potentially to U.S. or Israeli military strikes. So the administration has to be very careful if they decide to walk away from the deal to plan for all of these contingencies. I know you've been a critic of the nuclear agreement. Tell me what sort of the, the, the heart of that criticism is and what the better approach you think would be. I've been a critic, a long-standing critic, of this nuclear agreement, but not of a nuclear agreement. Mm -hmm. And so I've been a long-time advocate of fixing the agreement. The, the problem with the deal is it's very architecture. There are The restrictions on Iran's nuclear program actually go away over time. They sunset, mm -hmm. regardless of Iranian behavior. And so Iran emerges with an industrial size nuclear program with near-zero nuclear breakout. It has these powerful advanced centrifuges, which enable an easier clandestine sneak out. Um, it does all of this by following the deal. And it can also test uh, missiles. And if this atomic archive is any indication, they have kept the option alive to design warheads. And then they have all three elements for a nuclear weapon. So the deal needs to be fixed. And the United States and the Europeans have been negotiating since January to fix the deal. I think the Europeans have come a long way. They got to come further before May the 12th. Mm -hmm. But the president needs to take that uh, supplemental agreement that's being reached with Europe seriously. And if it's a serious agreement, he should consider it uh, thoughtfully and evaluate it thoughtfully and not necessarily walk away from the deal if we've been able to reach an agreement with our European allies. Talk a little bit about the timing here, because even the supporters, the people who advocate for the agreement as it is now, will talk about what they were able to achieve in that moment. And you're talking about the protests and the sort of political atmosphere within Iran now. Is this the time, you think, when a, a different kind of agreement could be reached? I think, the, I think so. I mean, I think the regime is very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's uh, politically vulnerable. It's economically vulnerable. Again, it's, its political base is turning against it. And so this is the time where the United States, if it applied uh, massive economic and political pressure, could potentially bring the Iranians back to the table to negotiate a follow-on agreement. I mean, everybody forgets that the nuclear deal has been great for Iran, technically, in terms of the nuclear program and the missile program, as I described. But they completely overestimated how much economic relief they would get from the deal. And it's deadly for a president to overpromise and underdeliver uh, in any system. And you, you're seeing in the Iranian system what happened with Hassan Rouhani, who exaggerated the economic benefits that he thought he was going to get without understanding that Iran's continued malign activities were going to sideline banks and companies who weren't going to be willing to go into Iran if Iran continued to support Bashar Assad's slaughter in Syria or fire off missiles or support terrorism. So they have a reason to come back to the table and see if they can get more economic relief to, to save the regime from potential uh, impending collapse. That's the other piece of this that you, you raised, the human rights issue both internally and externally, and Iran's role and reach and how it sees itself in the region. Where do you see the intersection between the nuclear agreement and those kinds of sanctions and whether or not, in fact, it might have an influence on human rights or the sort of broader geopolitical stuff that's going on? So I think a comprehensive strategy um, that the United States, that Canada, that our European allies could employ is to really see the threat not just as a nuclear threat or as a missile threat, but as a regime threat. And this, is, this regime has demonstrated that it's brutally repressive at home and it's aggressive abroad. And so we need to turn our attention not just to nuclear sanctions, terrorism sanctions. We need to think about human rights uh, and corruption because that really is eating away at the regime's legitimacy. And it's not only the right thing to do to support Iranians who are being brutally repressed by their, their leadership, but it's a smart thing to do because I think what it does is it ad applies additional political pressure on this regime that either this re regime better change fundamentally its conduct uh, and reach a nuclear deal that is sustainable and real and that's actually going to prevent it from developing nuclear weapons and not provide patient pathways to nuclear weapons. Um, but also that this regime, if it doesn't stop brutally repressing its own people and supporting the slaughter and Assad, can you imagine what it'll do to us? if it ever gets the means to do so. I know you've talked about regime change. And when uh, observers hear that, it puts up all kinds of right. red flags. But from your point of view, what does regime change actually mean? Regime change means the peaceful transformation of Iran to a different government that respects the civil liberties and human rights of its people. 
It means what the great... It doesn't mean troops on the ground. No, it does not mean 500,000 mechanized U.S. troops invading Iran. I mean, I think that would be a massive mistake. Mm -hmm. What it means is supporting people like Shrin Abadi, the great U.N. Nobel Prize winning laureate and human rights defender, who's called for regime change. She's used those words. And what she means is a secular constitution, getting rid of the office of the supreme leader, holding a referendum on a new Iran, a democratic Iran, and supporting the legitimate rights of Iranians to change their government. Without a change in this government, they will never be safe um, and we will never be secure. You used the word inflection point when you were talking to MPs on the Hill today. Are, are, is Iran at an inflection point? It may be. It may be. I mean, it's, uh, Iran was at an inflection point in 2009 when millions of Iranians were on the streets yelling, death to the dictator, where's my vote, after the fraudulent election of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. We may be at another inflection point, uh, a different one actually, where now Iranians are on the streets yelling, where's my paycheck? Stop spending billions of dollars supporting Assad and Hezbollah and foreign adventurism. And again, because these are, are blue collar Iranians, these are Iranians that have typically supported the regime, we're in a different inflection point than in 2009 when you had North Tehranis on the streets who are middle class or upper class Iranians. We're looking for more political liberty. These are Iranians today who are looking for political liberty, but they're looking for economic reforms. They're looking for a paycheck. And I think that there is potentially an inflection point. I wouldn't overstate it, um, and I wouldn't overstate necessarily the vulnerability of this regime. It still will use brutality, as it's done in the past, to uh, put down any of these protests. But I think that the United States and Canada and our allies have a real opportunity now to support the Iranians who are on the streets uh, looking for a better future. Thank you very much for your expertise and your insight. Thanks for having me, Allison.